hosted by Doug Paget, Brett Johnson, and Hunter Hawes. That's right, and it's a Monday, so that means uh, two of the three of the uh, Minnesota Progressive Repartee trifecta in today. Doug Paget here with uh, Brett in the studio. Hey, buddy, how did it go getting into the studio for you today? Did you uh, were you walking yeah. like a baby deer on ice, like the rest of us? <laughs> I kind of felt like that uh, last night going out to a friend's place, not to watch the Super Bowl, by the way, but just for another activity. Uh, yeah, it was interesting walking to my car, man. Uh, kind of like I needed uh, hockey skates or figure skates to navigate the streets of Minneapolis. Oh, for sure. I, I have a friend yeah. who uh, who used to work for a, uh, a, a company that does uh, ha- you know, hand and wrist surgeries, like they sell products for hand and wrist surgeries. Days like today, I think uh, that's this is the day where they make all their money. This is like this is like their Black Friday because uh, people are falling down and, uh, you know, getting hurt left and right. It's uh, it is brutal. Um, uh, so be careful if you if you've already been outside, you know it. Um, and it's apparently just going to get just going to become more icy again tonight. Uh, but we are we are experiencing the full range of Minnesota weather in the last week. Uh, a polar vortex, a uh, 40 degree, uh, seven o'clock, eight o'clock at nighttime on Saturday uh, where winter was enjoyable. Uh, and then uh, an ice storm uh, all within a week. It's, uh, you know, record setting temperatures on the low end, uh, 10 or 15 degrees above normal. And then an ice storm. It's uh, it's the full package. That's what we call and, the four seasons. And then, surrender. Yeah, then two to four inches of snow tomorrow. It's everything. <laughs> That's awesome. That's, Isn't that uh, going to be delightful to have snow on top of that ice? So when that oh, snow melts, oh, guess what we get to experience yep, again? Yep, yep. Hey, I went out to the Loppet on uh, Saturday night. Are you familiar with this? It's at Lake of the Isles. It's hmm. an ice sculpture and lumin- illuminated uh, ice sculptures out on the ice. Uh, thousands of people uh, out there. Um, it's a, it's a true Minnesota activity. I, I wish I had remembered to talk about it during the week last week. So people would, um, uh, put it on their calendar if they didn't know about it. It's free. I mean, just incredible, uh, kinds of, of ice sculptures, including an ice orchestra, people with, uh, drums made out of, out of, I mean, think like if you can imagine the, uh, winter carnival sort of, uh, done in in ice sculptures this 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 kind of thing incredible uh, uh work and effort that goes into this uh, uh an orchestra all these like uh, ob- obliques um lighted up with candles in them the i mean just 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 wonderful uh a perfectly minnesota kind of arctic uh experience so if anyone listening is uh part of that loppet and you make that happen uh uh, toodles to you from the repartee because that's uh, about as impressive uh, as they come. Uh, just another way that the good people of Minnesota stay hardy. You know, it's a, it's a hardy crowd. You can, you're not going to get us with a vortex or a, a nice storm. Not going to hold these people down. We're uh, we are up and ready for it. Wouldn't hey, part of that be kind of depressing if you're making these really cool sculptures and you just know they're going to melt in a few months? All your work is going away, dude. That's what I was thinking. Like this yeah. this orchestra, they they made uh, like what are the What's that instrument called where you, you hit it with the little mallets and, you know, it's got the, the little um, metal pieces, uh, xylophone. Uh, mm-hmm. They have like a xylophone made just out of ice. So they're like, punk, 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 punk. And because of the thickness of the ice, it's making different tones. And their guys are playing drums and musicians and fire throwers and uh, uh, hula hoopers. Just uh, in- incredible. All for one night. The whole thing. The loppet goes one night. One. Like Saturday. Yeah, I'm yeah. telling you, Google that thing. Uh, you know, uh, if you're driving, don't do it while you're driving. Uh, but but if you're not, uh, you know, uh, after the commercials uh, here on AM 950, where you listen to our sponsors, Google it. Uh, Lop it pictures. It'll blow your mind if you've never been out there. And you'll say to yourself, I'm putting that on my calendar for 2020. I'm going to get out there in that uh, out there on Lake of the Isles and see it. It's uh, it is a it is a fantastic uh, demonstration of the ridiculousness of Minnesotans, how much work we will do, uh, how much we will brave the cold. And then just um, it's like sand art uh, made with ice where people will make in a you know, on a beach or, uh, uh, you know, an area on a, a flat surface. They'll do an entire beautiful uh, image on with sand 
and then it just they just sweep it away. It's it's meant to be temporary. Well, this entire loppet wonderfulness is uh, uh, comes and goes. That's it. It's just uh, it's just in and out. <laughs> I find it to be just fascinating. Hey, you said you didn't you didn't uh, watch the Super Bowl last night, huh? I just wasn't interested in the matchup very much, although I, I won't lie, I watched a few plays of it, including the interception at the end, so I saw the one play I needed to see. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm normally a football fan, but I just had no mm. interest in the game mm. this year. Well, look, it must have been Freaky Sunday, like Freaky Friday, because I, I pay no attention to football as a you know as an act of, of protest. Uh, but I watched uh, the game at a party. There was a party going on, and I, I paid attention uh, to it. And it was, you know, whatever. Uh, one team beat another team, and that had a lot of meaning for gamblers and uh, for the NFL, and I guess for those for those teams and people root for them. Mm-hmm. But the halftime show. Now the halftime show, my friend, uh, have you heard, have you heard about this? Did you? Did you was it to- as bad as people are saying it was? <laughs> well, unless- or, or are you in the same boat as Matt, where he says, "Well, everyone always says the halftime show stinks. It's just kind of a thing people do." I don't know. I don't know. I get. Is it as bad as what people are saying? If they're saying it was possibly the worst thing they've ever seen in their lives, then I would say yes, it's as bad as what people are saying. It was. It's it's a new level of of. Uh, what you can get away with and call that some kind of media. Uh, it was lackluster, ridiculous. Everybody phoning it in. Uh, this guy who's the lead singer of Maroon 5, which I don't know if that's a full band or if it's just the, the lead singer. Um, it's a full, very mediocre pop band. <laughs> yeah, because it was just him, Adam Levine, I think his name is, and then a uh, uh, a guitar player that I could tell who was part of that. Anyway, they, like... Apparently, they didn't want to be there, is what I could tell, and I could see why. It was, but then he he disrobed. I don't know if you know this. Um, he he ends up, uh, starts with a jacket on, and then takes his jacket off. And some of us were saying, well, it's about time he took his jacket off, because he's a man with uh, very, very strong shoulders. I just happen to know this about the guy. And uh, But then shortly after taking off the jacket, which exposed his shirtless or his sleeveless T-shirt, he then took off the t-shirt to show off his um uh, his his well sculpted uh uh body and his uh, very very nice collection of tattoos now i'll tell you he is an attractive fella i think just generically generally speaking people would say that adam levine guy is a good looking guy uh shirt on or no shirt on where you know uh, uh my ability to be a good looking person is totally clothed related clothing related but for him he can look good just like that but the idea and here's my little rant about this that we had a near, uh, you know, uh, FCC fine one year, decades ago, when a female nipple was shown. Remember all that? Oh, the wardrobe malfunction, yes. The wardrobe malfunction. If it's a woman <clears throat> and there's a momentary, minimal half second of seeing a nipple the country goes into cardiac arrest uh, at the FCC level to think if someone should be fined and was it even uh, done on purpose or not. And then here a guy, a white guy, just gets to stand out there and disrobe all the way down and show off his his butt. Like it is, if you think that the NFL is sort of built around this kind of weird elitism that that is just this male-dominated uh, a scene of permission giving of bad behavior of men yelling at other men and and w- women on the sideline being cheerleaders and while they cheer on their their heroes out on the field if if that all that gets to you as it does me uh, now if it doesn't none of this is going to make much sense to you but if it does then the halftime show which can have a guy and he can be as sex symbol as he wants to be and he can be out there uh donning a fully bared chest and it was just in poor taste it was just kind of it was kind of not classy right um uh but the contrast between that and heaven forbid if a woman were to ever go on uh, the Super Bowl halftime, as uh, my hero Lady Gaga did, uh, she was totally freaked out about not overexposing because that would be some huge tragedy that would require some sort of fine and be called indecent. So th- there's this just odd, like, uh, uh, double standard. And I'm not saying women want to be bare-chested or anything else, but just the sheer... 
brazen nature of this halftime show being so bad and so lackluster and so uh, non-interesting, having its big thing be that uh, Adam Levine gets to be as you know naked as he wants out there, and uh, that women have to make sure that they've put extra tape on parts of their body so that they won't be exposed. It, it just reeks of all the trouble uh, and the double standard and, uh, and, and all of that that I think it's just, it, it just made me nutty again. And I thought, well, I, I am not the audience. I'm not the guy that should be watching football or halftime shows. Uh, so that's that's my. Do you know why they ended up going with Maroon Five in the first place? Was that apparently a lot of musical artists decided they didn't want to perform at the halftime show over the Colin Kaepernick controversy, kind of wanting to stand in solidarity with him since no NFL team will sign him. Couldn't be more proud of those people, all of them, yeah. whomever it was. Like, like good I could look up the names during the break, but a lot of them, yeah, said they. I've heard that went yeah. public and said they turned down the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah, and that that Maroon Five then, uh, you know, was and, and look, I mean, if you can play the Super Bowl, I guess, and you're a rock star, you're like we're playing the Super Bowl if if you don't have another reason to, you know, to to be standing for something. Uh, so I just felt the whole thing was just in just in bad taste, and it just smacked of the hypocrisy. Uh, and all the rest of it. So, all right, we don't have to talk any more about the Super Bowl. After the break, I'm done. That's off my chest. I do want to talk about one commercial that was on there. It was actually a Bud Light commercial, but we'll talk about that in the second half. Because when we come back, I want to do uh, uh, a little commentary on the wonderfulness of Black History Month, which is the month of February. So we'll talk about that here on Minnesota's Progressive Repartee when we come back after the break. Hey, I'm Lori Fitz from Connections Radio Show, and I want you to join us for Repartee on the Minnesota Progressive Repartee. Oh, that's nice of Lori Fitz. See, what she means by join us for Repartee is where Repartee means uh, witty banter. So this is the Minnesota Progressive witty banter in your afternoon. I'm Doug Padgett. Uh, Brett's in the studio. Uh, and some days you get Hunter and Doug, sometimes Hunter and Brett, sometimes Brett and Hunter. Uh, yeah, you know, we... Uh, it's a, little, it's a little combo deal amongst amongst all of us. And all right. when the stars align, all of us. Oh man, those are those are some killer yeah. days. I mean, just <laughs> just really, yeah. We, we we have to we have to reserve those uh, so that you know, like when when people come on March second to the Blue State Ball, they really uh, you know they 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 feel that they feel that 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 <laughs> that triune kind of power that comes together when, when we're all there. Hey, Brad and Robbinsdale. Uh, you got a couple of thoughts here. I, I didn't want to talk too much more about Super Bowl, but maybe you've got a little comment about it. Okay, well, I wasn't going to, well, first of all, that halftime show was atrocious, but, you know, I was going to observe you're talking about Black History Month, and I know that one person who's not going to be very popular is going to be Governor Ralph Northam of Virginia, and I just want to observe that, I mean, he has a real hard decision to make, whether he wants to have something of a future after he resigns, wow. or whether he wants to have no future after he resigns. Yeah, Brad, I think that's a really good point. I, a lot of us here in Minnesota who were yep. s- supporters of uh, Al Franken uh, feel that, that very pressure that he must be feeling, that uh, the governor of Virginia, Governor Northam, must be feeling about uh, if he resigns or not, right? Because a lot of us thought that when Al Franken stepped down as being a senator because of the um, uh, the the revelations about his previous behavior, uh, which he didn't deny, unlike uh, Northam is now currently doing. Um, a lot of us have felt like, man, it's just he's not going to recover from that. Like it's 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 uh, I, I'm torn about what I think if Al Franken should have stepped down. I, I, I agree with him uh, if he still believes it was the right thing, like he would know better than anyone else if he could maintain the moral authority without doing some kind of an apology or some kind of um, reconciliation. Uh, seems to me that Northam can't, and and Brad's good com- Brad from Robbinsdale's good comment uh, uh, is because it's Black History Month. Now you you might know a lot about Black History Month already, um, but just in case, I want to give you a couple of a couple of uh, reflections here on the history of Black History Month. Been around for a long time. I was surprised to learn this that Black History Month had its roots in a Black History Week called Negro History Week in 1926. When someone named Carter Woodson, who was uh, a scholar and uh, an intense uh, thinker and historian, um, and the Association for the Study of Life and of Negro Life and History, announced that the second week of February would be Negro History Week, specifically wanting schools 
to focus on the history of what then was called the Negro experience. Now we tend to call the black experience, the black experience in America, something more than only being people who were influenced by slavery for the many, many contributions that that Negroes of the time and African-Americans and other blacks in this country have contributed to this society. And so it then uh, took off, and uh, for a long time it was one week. And the reason it was set the week that it was set in the second week of February is because for a hundred years previous to that, the black community had celebrated black history and black culture inside of black communities, they celebrated that because it was Frederick Douglass's birthday on February 14th and Abraham's Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's birthday on February 12th. So that's why they picked that week. I, I just really like those kinds of facts about um, important uh, histories, like uh, how we got to a black history week and then how we got to a black history month. So it came out of black culture wanting to organize and to celebrate and then became more of a national invitation into one week. And then in the 1970s, really at the instigation of people at Kent State in 1969. Now, Brett, there might ring a bell for some people because they might remember Kent State as being the place where there was a shooting where protesters were uh, being told by the police, you know, to uh, to stop their protests about the Vietnam War. And they didn't. And someone in the uh, in the authority uh, crowd, I don't know if it was military or a police officer, shot someone and opened up fire on the uh, protesters there at Kent State. It was most known for that. So when I've thought about Kent State, that's what comes to mind. But actually, Kent State was the place that in February of 1969, they, black educators and the Black United students, first celebrated the entirety of Black History Month. They said all of February needs to be Black History Month. Kind of a fascinating history to it. And then, uh, that being 1969, in 1976, Gerald Ford, president, then recognized Black History Month during a celebration of the United States Bicentennial. And he, as it's quoted in this story, seized the opportunity. He he, he urged all of Americans to, quote, seize the opportunity to honor the far too often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. Now, it moved from a week, well, it moved from a uh, uh reminder and and an effort within the black community in the 19th century to 1926 becoming a week 50 years later becoming recognized as an entire month and now a lot of uh people who have some critiques about black history month remind us wisely that we shouldn't we need to be careful that black history month does not allow us to sort of marginalize black history as if it deserves only one month because as a number of people, including Morgan Freeman, recently put it, he said, I don't want a black history month. Black history is American history. So his point is, let's stop acting as if it's a separate history that we should focus on. Like there's American history. And then, you know, during February, you talk about black history. His point being, it's all American history. It's the same for any tradition that makes up the great American history. So I like this idea that it moved from being something within the black community to then becoming a week within the nation's consciousness to then becoming an entire month to then, as Morgan Freeman is suggesting, that we begin to articulate black history just as American history, and it infiltrates all of our uh, way of thinking about our history, especially inside of education. I'd love to talk about this when we come back here after the break, because The primary place where black history plays out is in the places where we teach history, which is in our educational system. Uh, And sometimes on like the history channel, they'll do an entire, uh, you know, uh, kind of programming around black history uh, month. Um, But in the education system, there's a lot of effort that goes into making sure that there is um, awareness and effort and integration going on in the uh, educational system. So uh, if you have some stories about your own experience of Black History Month uh, with uh, how you were taught it or things that are going on, the YMCA has something really cool going on. I'll tell you about that here after the break, too. Uh, Love to hear your thoughts. The phone number, of course, is 952-946-6205. I'm on Twitter at Paget, P-A-G-I-T-T. 
Uh, hey, Brett, is there is there a does someone keep up on the on an AM nine fifty Twitter feed? I was uh, I thought I had that down. Is it is it AM nine fifty radio? Yep, AM nine fifty radio. radio. Correct. Good. That is yeah, the right. Twitter feed of the station. All right, I'm putting that out. So maybe if you send something there, I don't know. Brett or I will look at it. I, I can't can't guarantee that, but I think if you send it to Badger, we will. Uh, so that's the rep our day. We'd love to have your voice in on it, and we'll talk a little bit more about Black History Month when we come back here after the break on Minnesota's Progressive Rep our day on Minnesota's Progressive Voice AM nine fifty. Hi there, this is Alan Miller speaking, the local and studio curmudgeon. You're listening to, and wisely so, Minnesota Progressive Repartee. I love it that the uh, resident curmudgeon is the only one that understands the repartee word in our little bumpers. Um, we have a little fun with that because we know a lot of people don't, uh, you know, haven't kept up on their French. Um, a lot of us feel like we need to bone up on our Russian. Back when I was in school, we all thought we had to bone up on our Japanese uh, because the Japanese economy was taken off and all the American companies were learning from Japanese companies. And so we were thinking that uh, back, you know, in the uh, 1970s, all the people took French. I don't know why. French and German. I guess it was a holdover from World War II. Um, so you might not know the word repartee if you don't study your French, but it means a, uh, a witty banter. So that's what we try to do. Hey, it's Black History Month in February, uh, which, you know, it's great around the country. I, I've always thought as a Minnesotan, um, it's kind of a, you know, Kind of a cold month that also has to compete with Valentine's Day. It's like the love month, but I guess those two things go together. Uh, It's in February because uh, the African-American community of the 19th century uh, organized around talking about black history uh, because Frederick Douglass's birthday is February 14th and Abraham Lincoln's birthday, February 12th. Uh, So uh, Douglass born on Valentine's Day, which is kind of fun. Uh, that became the time when they um, uh, got together to talk about uh, issues of um, what then was called Negro life in, in the United States. And we're still trying to figure out how to talk about it. It's, uh, it's a super big deal. It's, um, it's not easy for people to uh, engage in these conversations. So I want to let you know about something that I've just, uh, just read about that's happening over at the YMCA Center downtown and uh, has an opening tomorrow, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. on February 5th is the grand opening for something called the Equity Innovation Experience. And this is a chance for people to, uh, the YMCA has put this together. It's, it's being highly regarded. It's highly touted. We're going to try to have some people on from the YMCA to talk about this over the next couple of days so you can hear about it. Um, but they, what they want to do is increase uh, cultural competence um, and move from equity, from theory, into practice. This is the kind of work that um, that the uh, that this experience wants wants to give people. And what I'll, what some people have already taken it. There's a group of college students from North Central University, which is a downtown um, uh, located uh, you know, on campus university. And uh, one of the people who runs their multicultural engagement uh, support there at North Central University uh, is quoted in this article in the Star Tribune. Uh, and he's talking about the students' experience who went through the um, this this um, innovation uh, experience on on equity and race. And his quote is: "There is a certain naivete because Minnesota has a history of being very liberal and somewhat socially responsible to its citizens, right? And I, I, I'm I'm glad that people are, are reminded of this, right? That that Minnesota has a has a liberal history and a a socially conscious history." So um, when, as a side note, uh, our conservative uh, sister and brethren uh, want to argue for uh, us becoming more conservative, uh, that's a that's an argument they should make, and they should have to make it inside of the context of it being a traditionally progressive, liberal, social, socially engaged uh, citizenry. But then he goes on to say, but this presentation really jarred the students' historic understanding. Because it disturbed the false narrative that families of colors were not ready for or did not want to buy homes or to attend college at the same rates as whites. There's a lot of Minnesotans who uh, recognize that our housing has been unfair in this country and are in the state and that our educational system, which is based on housing because we do our education based on the place where you live. So our school districts are oriented in such a way. 
that what happens in housing gets repeated in the education system or gets repeated in the education system then becomes a part of the employment system and then the employment system becomes part of the housing system. So if you can stop the cycle at housing, which is why in Minnesota there were uh, so many practices, sometimes legal and sometimes illegal practices that prevented people of color, especially black people, from living in certain parts of our cities. And that insidious actions has consequence for generations. And uh, what, what I have come to understand as a person who's grown up in the state and cares about it, I don't, I don't think our incrementalism that we're using to deal with the issues of systemic racism uh, have done the trick. I think there has to be something more drastic done. Uh, uh, you know, some of us, Hunter, uh, I think, talks about this a bit when, when he's on. I like talking about it, too, that the that the base minimum income is actually was something advocated for by Martin Luther King Jr. And ultimately uh, even advocated for by Richard Nixon because it was a very conservative and liberal idea back in the 70s. Uh, and we should revisit that as a uh, more progressive or, if you like, a kind of Nixonian a conservative idea that you have a base minimum income was a way to respond to the generational impact that happens when you take a whole race of people and not allow them to buy property because in our country for what rights are wrong it has been the greatest way to create family wealth is to own property i don't know if that's going to stay true going forward but i've got a pretty uh, a pretty strong intuition that it's going to be so when you have a a generation upon generation who cannot buy or could not get loans or realtors would direct them away or housing properties and new built construction would have uh, laws or uh, bylaws written into them that would keep uh, non-whites and non-Christian whites from buying their properties, that creates a generation upon generation impact. So if you're going to deal with the the loss of income, the loss of social status, the loss of education inside of a subset of our population, you probably have to get there by something more aggressive than, well, let's just change that now. As long as we change it now, then we will catch up. Because if you spend 150 years in that system, how long do you think incrementalism is going to take before you rectify that situation? It's never Right. It can never catch up to the first 150 years of that kind of behavior. And this isn't only true for the African-American community, for the black community, of course. It's also true for the indigenous communities and for a lot of other people of color who have not been able to access the same parts of our society. And this is a super hard thing for some of us in Minnesota to reconcile because uh, we don't in the north think we have to deal with issues of systemic racism because the glaring actions of slavery and segregation of the South seem like they're from another place and we didn't have to experience that. A lot of people think that. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to uh, a history shame anyone. I don't want to say that, well, you know, if you didn't know that, then you're obviously not, you know, you're not you're not, you're not very woke. You're not very, very uh, in tuned to what's been going on. There's a lot of reasons why people know wrong things. Sometimes we've been lied to. Sometimes we've been willfully ignorant. Sometimes we had some of the facts, but not all of them. Sometimes we forget because they're not pressing issues in our lives. There's a whole lot of reasons that a person might uh, hold a belief or a set of assumptions about why we have systemic poverty in Minnesota uh, that um, has to be solved in some way. And I believe that uh, this has to be solved by uh, more broad systemic systemic changes. Uh, but I don't know, but there's, you know, there's a, a, a big um, resurgence in the reparations conversation in this country uh, that uh, the country mm -hmm. owes reparations to um, those who've had their land taken, the indigenous peoples of, these con of this country, and uh, for those who were uh, brought here via slavery to serve in the uh, industrialization process, and that some kind of reparations have to be paid because that's the only way people are going to catch up. That is a really... Uh, I don't know where I am on that. It seems like that's the thing we have to do. I can't imagine how we can get there without it. But on the other hand, that is so complicated. I don't know how we would ever do it. Well, all of that to say, this is Black History Month. And these are the kinds of things that, that 
the the upside to Black History Month, the upside to the focus on it, the up the the, the thing I want to advocate for us keeping it, even if we do as uh, the actor Morgan Freeman encourages to talk about uh, American history as Black history and Black history as American history. I get that, but I think we also need to have a month in which someone uh, at school, someone at work, someone who's programming at the History Channel, someone who runs a, uh, a repartee radio show can talk about it because the collective focus on black history uh, gives us permission. Because if we wait around for us to just bring it up when it kind of comes into the popular uh, vocabulary and conversation, it rarely does. Issues of systemic racism, especially on the black community in the United States, is uh, difficult for many of us to talk about. It's difficult for black friends of mine to talk about because they don't know if they have willful partners uh, on the other side. And it's difficult because within the black community, there's a range of, no of knowledge and understanding. It's difficult for white people to bring it up because we don't know if we should even be talking about it without uh, talking specifically with uh, people who are impacted by these issues. So it gets really complicated and we won't talk about it. We have the thing we have shown in this country is we will find a way to avoid talking about it. So much so that when uh, this Governor Northam of Virginia has a picture from 1984 for the love. I mean, I, I was graduating from high school in 1984. I was pretty aware. I wasn't a medical school student, but as a high school student here at Hopkins High School, I was paying enough attention to know that you don't stand with someone wearing a Ku Klux Klan outfit. Where do you even get a Ku Klux Klan outfit? Mm -hmm. I mean, look. That thing was a real deal Klu, Klu Klux Klan outfit, right? I mean, that, that wasn't like, oh, is that a toga or is that a Ku Klux Klan outfit? No, that was pretty, that was pretty legit. And how do, you, how do you get a guy in a black face? Uh, like like that, that's even something that you would think was, was, uh, was funny. I bring that up because even in 1984, when Jesse Jackson was doing all that he could to try to push the Democratic Party in a way that would include uh, African-American expression so much more, it was available everywhere from politics to news to television to the civil rights movement memory. There's so much. It was everywhere. And we still won't talk about it. And it shows up now. And by God, I will tell you, I've heard it from other people. I felt it, uh, twinges of it in myself that when people were like, well, in a picture in 1984, Governor no uh, Northam, some people were saying like, oh, are you going to bring that up? Are you going to bring up stuff from 35 years ago? Like, my gosh, we will find a way to not talk about the racist history of this country. It, we'll, 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 we'll use the excuse if it was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. If it was right now, we'll say, well, that that just happened. You can't hold it. I mean, everybody gets to make a mistake. Well, let's let's not focus on the on the small issues. Right. It, it's unbelievable. We will find a way to not talk about it if we can find a way to not talk about it. So I like the idea that we have Black History Month. I hope that people talk about it. If you have a chance to, to have a conversation with a friend or write something on social media, just say, hey, being Black History Month and all, why don't we engage in a conversation about these things? And if you have, uh, you know, uh, uh, friends and family that are from uh, that, that have experienced uh, black life in America and around the world, uh, talk with them about it, too. Uh, it'd be really helpful. So give, give, give me a call here. Nine, five, two, nine, four, six, six, two, zero, five. If you want to chat about that after the break, AM 950, the progressive voice of Minnesota and Minnesota's progressive repartee. <laughs> it is actually 450. And man, Brett, I'm looking outside. The sun is out. It's not just a thing because the sky has uh, opened up, um, but because we're at the time of the year when at nearly five o'clock, the sun is still out. It's happening. It's happening. That, that was just rough after these shows during the repartee in like December when the Ugh. show was over. It's dark. Yeah. It's dark it, as night. Ugh. Yeah. It was a it, it, it was like the, the end of the, the parte. The rep parte. <laughs> it was like the, like the lights going out. Hey, speaking of lights. uh you probably didn't see the all the commercials, but there was a Bud Light commercial on the Super Bowl yesterday. And, uh, you know, they spent a bunch of money. And what Bud Light was doing was making a big point that in Bud Light, they don't use corn syrup. Now, OK, here, here's the connection here. I, I didn't know any beers use corn syrup. I, I often refer to Bud Light, which uh, uh, when I drink beer, I drink Bud Light. 
um, I'm like the Del Secchi guy, uh, but not classy. Um, <laughs> and uh, I like it a lot, uh, especially Bud Light Lime. Man, that's just a treat. I hope we have that at the Blue State Ball. I, I, I'd be willing to pay for that if you know if there's a if there's pay bar there. But anyway, uh, uh, they were uh, the 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 people from uh, Bud Light and Heiser Bush were making a big point that they don't have corn syrup in their beer because apparently a number of the other uh, uh, rival brands do use corn syrup in their in their beers. So they had this this uh, this big corn syrup barrel being pulled, and by a medieval caravan, and uh, it was being pushed to castles that were owned by Miller and Coors. So apparently, in their diet beers, which is what I like to refer to as light beer, in their diet beers they use some sort of corn syrup, but Bud Light doesn't, right? So Bud Light's trying to make a big deal about like, hey, hey, we don't use corn syrup. Well. Guess who had a problem with that? Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the farmers were not happy, were they? The farmers were not happy. The corn farmers. The, the, okay, I'm going to now say something that uh, send all hate mail uh, uh, to Brett Johnson at AOL.com for this one. Uh, <laughs> yep, exactly. And, and, to Brett, me, yeah. and Brett, if you still have an AOL account, that's on you. Uh, but yeah. send to Brett Johnson at AOL.com if that's a problem, if you have a problem with this. But uh, the syndicate that is the corn farm growers on pushing corn syrup uh through this country it has it, they've had a long run uh well done uh but i do think the time is ending for corn syrup i think it's i think it's coming a, a bit to an end but anyway the corn syrup uh uh cartel kicked back pretty hard saying to to, to bud light um uh they they actually tweeted out the association of 40,000 corn farmers nationwide tweeted uh, that America's corn farmers were, quote, disappointed in Bud Light and thanked Miller Light and Coors Light for, quote, supporting the industry. So now Coors Light and Bud Light become like, hey, if you want to support farmers, corn farmers. Uh, then you drink those beers. So then Anheuser-Busch, has to, who makes Bud Light, responded with a quote that said, we fully support corn growers and will continue to invest in the corn industry. Bud Light Super Bowl commercials are only meant to point out a key difference in Bud Light from some of the other beers. And the company said in the statement, this effort is to provide consumers transparency and elevate the beer category. No, it wasn't. It was to try to say their beer has corn syrup in it. If you don't want to have corn syrup because the marketplace has moved against corn syrup. And I don't know, farmers. I just think you're fighting a, a, a losing battle on this one. If you uh, want to get um, a high fructose corn syrup um, to be advocated uh, by, by, it, by, by the drink industry, it has moved against uh, high fructose corn syrup like uh, it's uh, you know, a, me a me measles outbreak. And uh, I, I don't think there's any getting it back. But I just found that to be an, because this is a, you know, there's a number of, of corn f uh, farmers uh, here in Minnesota. And I thought that was an interesting cultural shift and push and pressure point on our corn farmers. Uh, I don't know what they do about it, but uh, between the beet sugar people and the corn sugar people, um, Minnesota and Minnesota farmers have made an awful lot of their uh, uh, industry in Minnesota, and, and especially Iowa and Nebraska too, but, but between beets and corn, uh, it's been, we've been in the sugar business. We've been in the sugar fattening business. We've been in the, uh, in the, in the contributing to the health effects of uh, weight gain and obesity that comes through uh, liquid sugar. And look, who doesn't, who doesn't like a little liquid sugar? I mean, you know, let's you know put a little sugar on it. Every, everybody, er, nearly everyone I know likes sugar so much so that something happens in your brain when you when you get a dose of liquid sugar, especially like fructose corn syrup, sugar that comes in liquid form where your body can take it straight from liquid form and metabolize it and doesn't have to you know uh, break it down in some other form. Oh, that's gold. That is that is liquid gold to your body. Uh, it's in its response to it. But that response isn't all that healthy. That response isn't all that good. That response isn't something that most people still want. They want something else. Uh, and uh, so, the, you know, there's a big sugar battle 
uh, in this country. And and uh, Bud Light uh, <laughs> chose to dip its toes in there, and they got forty thousand uh, 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 farm corn farmers uh, going to the beer store and buying Miller and Coors. Apparently, hey Ruth in Maple Grove, you've got some uh, thoughts about corn syrup yourself? Well, we watched a documentary called Corn King that we got from Hennepin County Library, Mm -hmm. and I couldn't remember what the percentage was, so I Googled it, and it says roughly 60 to 70 percent of our processed foods in grocery stores contain corn, and then that's not, that's processed, that's not even counting the uh, animals that get fed corn, so I just had to, our huge part of our diet is corn, and Corn King was a documentary that was really informative, so thanks for taking yeah. my call. Yeah, Ruth, thank you, thank you for listening, and for, for of course, calling. Ruth called in 952-946-6205. You can jot that down by your phone or put it in your phone if you, if you want to be uh, ready to call as Ruth did. Yeah, Ruth, good point. Um, corn is king in this country, we all know that. Uh, there's no doubt about it, um, and uh, it's in a lot of products. And uh, we need to help corn farmers and beet farmers transition to something else. Um, We've been selling a bill of goods to people about corn and corn syrup and all the rest of it. Now, uh, there's a pushback, and uh, you can find it uh, all over the Internet. There's a lot of people that are like, look, corn syrup's not bad for you. But uh, I found it interesting, and the market is is clearly speaking and is currently moving on that one. So, hey, this is the Minnesota Progressive Repartee on on Minnesota's Progressive Voice, AM 950.